Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is my last sharing on habitation of God. <coughs> and uh, the title will be People with Hearts Like David. <coughs> People with Hearts Like David. 2 Samuel chapter 6. <coughs> and in 2 Samuel, and uh, I'm just going to remind you of a few things, but in 2 Samuel we had the place where God, where the ark rested, where God came to the place he wanted to and he rested and the ark rested within there. But <coughs> then they grabbed up the ark and, and instead of giving him a place of rest, they began to make him a tool for their protection and their prosperity and their blessing. And they took him up and took him out of his resting place and began to use him in a different way. And um, <coughs> so the ark ended up no longer being there because it was there to rest. <coughs> and uh, much of the church today is like Shiloh in that sense, that they are, uh, the, the ark has not found a place of rest and habitation <coughs> in the people of God. And they just carry on their religious activities and doing the things that they feel God wants them to do. And they look to God who is seated in heaven instead of him who is seated in us. And um, honestly, it's as if little thought is given <coughs> to standing up for God and for the heart of God and for the things of God and the things, you know, there, there's little teaching <coughs> about bringing back the ark. To his place of rest. I mean, there's just so little of that because everything is really um, <coughs> revolves around our needs and God exists for our purposes and whatever we need and think is important, then <coughs> that's, that's why we go to God. And during that, that time period where the ark was gone, <coughs> there were uh, so many people that lived and died, that came and went, that um, were, uh, thank you, brother, that existed <coughs> uh, so many, and yet nobody stood up and said, let's bring back the ark, except one. And uh, in Second Samuel 6, verse 1 and 2, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him <coughs> from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who dwelleth between the cherubim. <coughs> and David stood up for the heart of God. He, he discerned it, and he stood up for it, and he did something about it. He did something about it. I personally don't know how you can actually honestly, truthfully see the heart of God and not, not act upon it, but it, it's possible that people can do that. But David <coughs> was king, was made king, was made king, and his first act as king was to bring back the ark. I mean, can you imagine to the, to the Lord the preciousness of a guy that's made king where, where, you know, everybody else is already demanding their rights like they're king. All the individuals of Israel are, are seeking God for whatever they can get from him. But the man who's truly made king stands up for the things that are in the heart of God. <coughs> and... He's the one that brings back the ark, the ark to its resting place. <clears throat> Instead of having you turn there, I'm going to read a, a psalm, Psalm 26, 8. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. And <clears throat> every Christian on the planet talks about wanting to give honor to God. 
but how do we go about that? And what method are we doing? And in many cases, the way we're trying to bring honor to God is to get God to honor us or our church. Instead of becoming a resting place and a habitation for the Lord. And you hear the heart of David in this verse. You hear uh, <clears throat> one who genuinely is looking past himself. I mean, he lived for years without a habitation himself, many years on the run. And if you remember our story, <clears throat> when well, the, the scriptures actually in uh, uh, Psalm 132, if you'll turn there, that's the original one that I think the Lord really, really dealt with me on and um, where <clears throat> the different locations where David began to uh, hear the heart of God beginning in verse 1. Psalm 132, verse 1. Lord, remember David and all of his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed, I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I have found out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it in Ephrathah, and we found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou in the ark of thy strength. And if you remember... That was quoted <clears throat> by Moses as they were taking the ark through the wilderness and were trying to get through the wilderness so that they could get the ark to the place that God wanted it to come. <clears throat> and then also verse uh, 13 and 14. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it it is. He hath desired it for his habitation. I mean, there it is. It's just as plain, not a habit, his habitation. Then verse 14, this is the Lord speaking. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And clearly what you're seeing there is the desire of the Lord. And David, uh, <clears throat> David was, most of this psalm is David quoting um, his heart reaction to the Lord and to what the Lord desires. But here he is quoting, or it is as if the Lord is speaking. Now it's not David, and this will be significant as we get on today. It is, he is, God himself is speaking this thing. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, speaking of a habitation, for I have desired it. Look with me, if you will, in First Chronicles, chapter twenty-eight. <clears throat> and here <clears throat> is David. Uh, also, but this is after the habitation of the temple has been built, and you begin to hear his heart again. You begin to see that this man heard what God desired instead of went to God for what he desired. He heard what God desired. And how are you going to get that? I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing thing anyway. God, you know, you remember Joseph in, in, in Egypt. And, the, you know, my, my pronunciation of the name, or, nor yours, would be very good, but somebody probably has it down, but... They, they called Joseph Zaphnaphaniah, which meant he to whom God reveals his secrets, meaning God opened his heart to that man. And David was a similar man. <clears throat> you, know, show, you know, it wasn't show me a ministry, give me a ministry, make me a man of God, and then prove it by certain miracles and certain actions and make everybody know that I'm something. I, I don't even know you know, 
how you get to the place where God just starts opening his heart to you. Um, a lot of scriptures flashing through my mind here. Uh, but uh, in First Chronicles 28 and verse 2, <clears throat> And David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build an house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. And so the question is, do we have a heart like David? Do we have a heart after God? Um, and even more importantly, after this much sharing, do we, do we want a heart after the Lord? Do we want that? in us and working in us <clears throat> and you know it's just a fact from my viewpoint that this testimony has to be in the church and that's what the ark was called the ark of testimony inside the tabernacle inside the temple of God that's where the testimony was supposed to rest and this testimony is supposed to be in the church because that was the shadow and this testimony of Christ in you is supposed to be in the church and Christ at rest and Christ inhabiting us instead of us serving God without him living in us and God's way up in heaven. And, and, but, but, but it starts with us first, that we who are open to the Lord in these manners and, uh, you know, if, if we who are hearing these things aren't moved, what can we expect of people who really haven't ever even heard it before? I mean, who, you know, I mean, who is going to be moved toward the heart of God? Who? I mean, and, and for me, the answer is, well, I don't know. I mean, it has to be me then. You know, I mean, I can't move anyone else. I only have the power to move my own heart and and the things that I have to be used towards that end. And so, you know, if, 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 you, if God by his grace begins to touch you, what will it take to soften men's hearts and to prepare their hearts to even come to such a place? To, to not want to go through the veil and say, you know, enter boldly in and say, give me this, give me that, give me this, thank you, and walk out. But to come in and be quiet and listen to the Godhead talk among themselves and hear what's going on. Uh, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Instead of even trying to talk to you, just hearing their heart um, as one. And, <clears throat> and then so you realize that to, to have a heart like David involves... <clears throat> Two primary things. One is you've got to have your own eyes opened to this. The Spirit of God has to do that to show you the deepest desires of the Lord <clears throat> and those desires in relationship that he wants a place of rest, us, not the shadow, the real, in us, to live in us. And, and then after having eyes open, then... You have to set out to do something. That's why I started with, with uh, David saying, let's bring back the ark. And he gathered all the people. And, and, they, and it says, and they, the people were with him. And they went and did this. And, um, you know, maybe there are people here. Maybe there are people watching this or listening to this that will, it will explode in them. And they will gather the people toward this end. Because David did do that. And gathered the whole nation towards this end. The whole church should be gathered towards this end because this isn't something we're after. This is something that he's after. Why he created the earth. Why creation exists. Why you exist. You know, we say, well, I exist to, to marry so-and-so and to have this and to do this and to, you know, this end. That's, that's all pointed inward toward ourselves. But why, what, what was he after? Not just what we can get out of the thing. And I think of that woman with an issue of blood, how she pressed through the crowd, but, but greater than that, she was pressing for her needs. I just would love to see a picture of someone pressing through the crowd to touch Jesus 
to touch his heart. Not just to touch him and get healed back, but to touch his heart. And he would turn to God. God, who's, who, well, I don't even know how to put it into words, you know. Who would even think of me? Because he's so self-giving, we know we can get what we want. So who would even think of me, you know, he would say. And, and I believe that there is a quest, not just searching the scriptures, not just Bible studies. I, I believe that um, there, there has to become a quest. There has to be, you know, this, uh, you know, they, they write movies about all this stuff where someone goes on a quest or whatever, but. But those are all movies and those are all stories. I feel in my heart that this is a true end. That it was the end of David's life. It was the beginning. It was, it was what filled him from start to finish once he perceived this. And it became his lifelong quest. And he brought the Ark to Zion. But eventually, there was a great temple. And... Um, <clears throat> And to, to set ourselves or to, you know, set yourself or to, you know, whoever, wherever, to take upon that uh, quest and to say, not me, not I, but Christ. Not, not me living in here anymore. Christ living in me. And to make, I mean, if you just did it with yourself. Um, it would be more than he's got. You know, it would increase by one. <laughs> um, so, uh, discovering that need and then working to bring it to pass, working to see to it that, that God has that. In uh, look in uh, chapter twenty-two of First Chronicles, <clears throat> First Chronicles twenty-two, and we're just going to look at a couple of verses here. But we're you know we're talking about David. While you're turning there, we're talking about David, and <clears throat> you know he continued to put forth effort even in his latter years. Now that's I think I think. That is so admirable, I don't even know what to tell you, because um, it's easy when you're young to, to, to get on a quest. It's easy, really, There's a, you know, to find a cause and to go for it, regardless of what it is. It's just easy. But David stuck with it until the day he died. I mean, he never lost sight of the vision of God's heart. Not the vision that God gave to his heart, but the vision of God's heart. And, <clears throat> and the, the scriptures that we're about to read is the recognition on David's part that he knew he would soon be passing off the scene. And, and, and he saw the need for passing the torch on to someone else. Passing the torch on to the next generation. Passing the torch and and, and keeping this thing alive and real. And, and uh, he was so filled. And I just, I mean, I, I just am amazed. He was so filled with the matter that he saw to it here in these scriptures. And it's uh, verse uh, 11, 1 Chronicles 22, 11, and also verse 29. Uh, he saw to it that Solomon would still carry forth the burden of the Lord. And, that, and before we read it, the burden of the Lord. The Lord's burden. And that someone would do that. <clears throat> my, now, my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he hath said of thee. Listen to these words. Now set your heart and your soul to t seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the
covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. And this is also included in verse 29. I'm <clears throat> what I'm perceiving, per, perceiving by this is that he's now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord, not just, oh, just seek the Lord, just seek the Lord, but to seek the Lord to bring the ark to a real resting place, a temple, a place worthy, <clears throat> uh, and where we can pull the staves out and, and you know. <clears throat> but it's not going to happen unless there's a heavenly vision, unless God opens our eyes to the things I mean, I would call them the intimate realities, not just the things of God or the deep things. You know, not just the deep things, the intimate things. You know, you hear a lot about the deep things of God, but what about the intimate things of his heart? And if we don't, if we do not see this, then we'll just read right over scriptures that, and never really see the thing that, that God's got. For example, Reve book of Revelation chapter 11 and 19. You've probably read this verse many times. Revelation 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the temple of God, this is verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. Are you following? And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, the testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Heaven has to be open to see, to, to, with our very eyes, to catch a glimpse of this ark finding its resting place in the temple. Now, you may believe that God will open heaven one day or you'll go to heaven and you'll see that there's a temple and there's an ark there. But what if there actually isn't a temple and an ark, a physical building with a thing that we go, ooh, you know, a magical box what if the reality is heaven was open and we saw the temple, which is us, and this is, the, this is a vision of the heart of God meant to be at work in us? And unless heaven is open, we're not going to see this. We're not, we're, and again, we'll read scriptures, but we won't realize what God's trying to communicate. And that's the difference. You can read scripture but not really understand what he's trying to communicate. And over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse uh, 19 and 20, Paul is doing his usual thing. There are certain areas that Paul's shocked uh, uh, that the church doesn't know. They're, you know, like in Romans 6, it's the cross. <laughs> what? No, you know, you know, he goes through that ever so often. It's like he's shocked. You know, what? Know ye not? You know, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price? And that's all speaking of you're not your own as a house. Your body was bought. Your body was bought <clears throat> so that it could be a habitation of God. We are Jesus' resurrection temple. We're the final temple. We are Zion. We are the final temple. No more going to be built after us. That was all shadows. This is the true, and yet 
that was more real than this because they seemed to comprehend what God was trying to build and what he was trying to do. <clears throat> and therefore, we're the ones who, you know, no matter what the cost to us, we're the ones that have to see that God gets his habitation, that he gets the dwelling place. And we're the ones that have to work towards seeing that the church is formed after this I mean, we can just work on our little self. David took it beyond himself. <clears throat> and he made it his lifelong thing for all Israel to be brought into this purpose. And, you know, I mean, David, obviously, again, David had a heart after God. Do we have this kind of a heart that's after God? Are we willing to drop all of the, you know, other tasks and to reach out to bring forth God's purpose and to make ourselves a dwelling place and everywhere we go be a Levite that we try to set up and make sure that God has a habitation no matter where he goes. God wants that testimony. The testimony of the ark in the temple. He wants that testimony. That, that wasn't someone's idea. That's the Lord's idea. <coughs> And I see the temple is becoming a permanent structure. That this stuff becomes permanent in us, not passing or just another sermon. Or, oh, remember years ago when Brother Randy spoke on, you know, wasn't that good? <laughs> you, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But where we actually truly become the body of Christ and not just a term that we apply, but we live our own lives. We go our own way. We do our own thing. And whatever God wants to heck with him, here's what I want from God. Um, First Kings, if you'll turn there with me. Chapter 8. Verse um, 6, we'll just do, instead of reading all this, <coughs> we'll just hit a few ones. Verse uh, 6, and the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto its place into the inner sanctuary of the house to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. Now, verse 8, And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen outside. And there they are unto this day. And then verse 10 and 11. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, the cloud, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. <clears throat> there is a purpose to which we're to be dedicated. And this was what David was dedicated to, and this is exactly what Solomon fulfilled, that this ark came to its place of rest, and they pulled out the carrying, the staves, the carrying things, and they said, this is permanent from now on. You don't have to worry about it, you know. Whether you're going to have a permanent place here, this is your permanent place. And, and I tell you what, most every church you go to out there, they want the glory to fall. And yet this says, when the ark was put in his place, it says that, his place, not its. His, when the ark was brought to his place, and the ark represents the Lord himself, then the glory fell. And people go, well, why ain't the glory falling? Why ain't, you know? Well, it's not, gonna, it's not meant to fall on the church. It's meant to fill the church. It glory filled the temple. And that glory is the glory that the ark has been given its place. This testimony is supposed to be everywhere in the church. It's supposed to be known. And uh, turn with me to Hebrews now. This, this shows, Hebrews 3 shows that there, 
is a commitment. Even though we may not accept it or want it, there is a commitment and a dedication that is demanded of us in relationship to being his house. And Hebrews 3 <coughs> talks about that. <coughs> Hebrews 3 and verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Most of the time, my mind used to go to Christ as a son, but I realize he's just saying it's Christ who is the son, but it doesn't matter in the sense of the son. It matters that, he, that we are his house and he wants to dwell in us. God's son has a house. And if you'll notice the word if there, but a son over his own house, whose house are we if? That's conditional. Um, that there's a commitment and a dedication for that to take place. Uh, and, and the word if means that God's done his part, now we have to do our part. We have to be steadfast. We have to not become sidetracked by other church issues, but focused and steady to the end and committed to this thing that is in the heart of God and keep our hope steadfast to the end. And our confidence uh, pertaining to living as his house, not pertaining to salvation. This isn't talking about salvation. This is talking about being his house. And the if is in relationship, well, will, will we be that? <clears throat> or will we miss the point of that? Um, now I want to just share a couple of scriptures that I think uh, that the Lord has definitely touched my heart with uh, Luke chapter uh, 13 <clears throat> Luke 13 uh, beginning with verse 34 <clears throat> and these scriptures help me realize a couple of things personally and that is no matter how much I studied the heart of David, I realized that ultimately I am not and you will not be moved by David's heart. It can only move us just so far. I mean, truthfully, it can only move us so far. And <clears throat> the only way we're going to move where we need to is we have to see the heart of the Lord, not just David's heart. You understand what I'm saying? Because if we, because David's heart will move us temp temporarily, but then we go back. You know it's possible. You've probably done it. I've done it. You have to see the heart of the Lord in these things, and that way you go from a place of, of, of temporary change to permanent reality when you begin to see the heart of the Lord. And in uh, Luke 13, <coughs> verse uh, 34. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Um, well, let's read, let's read the next verse, which is 14.1. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat on the Sabbath day that they watched him. This whole thing is about a house. Um, you know, and here we read these words, and it's okay to read the words of the Lord, but we need to try to discern his heart, and I, don't, I try to express this over and over to the people of God, and I really feel I fall so short um, to not try to grasp scriptures, but to discern the heart of the Lord when he's speaking from his heart. And he's speaking from his heart here. Um, and 
to try to see what his tears are about. Jesus' tears, to try to find out what Jesus' tears are about. Well, he wept for Jerusalem. He wept over what was meant to become his habitation. And, you know, when he's there looking, overlooking Jerusalem, he knew that he was supposed to dwell in that house and it was supposed to be the glory of the whole earth, the joy of the whole earth. And his heart's broken because that house is now their house and it's left to them desolate because they're dwelling in it. They're the ones taking up the room. And uh, they rejected him. And, you know, we talked about rejecting the king. But in reality here, and they rejected the one who was meant to inhabit that and to give him themselves as that home. And, uh, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around a lot, but there are, I've covered so many scriptures before and I'm trying to hit several scriptures that I haven't. Turn with me to Ezekiel, and this is a powerful point found in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 11 and verse 22. And some of you may be familiar with it. Ezekiel has a lot of uh, really good things, but it, be, it, but it ends with those good things. It starts with things like this in Ezekiel 11. <clears throat> verse 22. Twenty-two and twenty-three. <clears throat> then did the cherubim lift up their wings. Now remember, the cherubim are those who stand in front of the Ark of the Covenant, in front of the Holy of Holies. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the, Lo of the God of Israel was over them above, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of that city. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing Jesus there. I'm seeing the scriptures we just read, where his, the glory went up out of the city and stood on that mountain overlooking the thing and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the true fulfillment of that scripture. As he looks, and, he's, and, and this is the, the title over this is The Vision of the Glory Departing. glory of God. But you know what? I've heard that all my life, and I read that here. It wasn't just the glory departed. He departed because we didn't make a place for him. You understand? It wasn't just the glory departed. See, that's, that's making glory something greater than him. He is the glory, the joy of the whole earth. And he, this, he fulfilled this as he looked over the city and said, you know, your house, you made it your house, and your house is left death desolate, and he has departed from that. And, and do we even see his heart? Do we see, like in, when he said, oh, Jerusalem, do we see how torn up he is? That's the thing that gets me. Do we see how torn up the Lord is as he's viewing his habitation and what's become of it and how it's ended up? Do we understand the tears of Jesus? Do we put them in a bottle and save them and ponder them? Or, or do we just think, oh, Lord, you put my tears in a bottle. You ponder my tears. Oh, precious Jesus. It's always about us. But just consider his heart. When he's pondering, when he's, when he's looking at Jerusalem, he's on the outside and they're on the inside. Let me just read a few of my notes here. It was never meant to be that way. Why did God give the Jews this land in the first place? And I'm quoting from Second Chronicles. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, they, God gave them the land, God gave them rest so he would give them rest. 
Are you familiar with the scripture, I and you and you and me? At that day, you shall know what, what it means when I and you and you and me. Well, we've all said, I'm in Christ, I'm secure, I've got all the resources of the vine, I'm in the vine, da 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 da. But what about him in us? What about giving him his place of rest and, and allowing for that? And I mean, to me, this is, do we, you know, do we care about Jesus or do we care that Jesus care about us? Master, carest thou not that we perish? Do we even care? I mean, honestly, do we even care? Do we, do we see his heart? Do we see his need? Do we see his tears and perceive the heart from which they're coming? Or do we just read through scripture? Well, we're just reading scriptures and this means this and that's, you know, I never, we, we're, try, we're hunting for some truth or so we can be right or this or that and we never see Jesus. We never see his heart. We never know what's going on with Jesus. Getting close to the end here, but I'd like for you all to turn uh, to this scripture, John chapter 7. And I want to look at these scriptures and see if we catch what's going on here. John chapter 7 and verse uh, 50. <clears throat> and we'll read uh, all the way um, all the way through the 8th chapter. Uh, verse 1 and 2 of the chapter 8. So starting at 7, chapter 7, verse 50. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, doth our law, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house, and Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Some would read these verses, and they would see that there was, you know, the majority of the people were against Jesus. Others would look, and they would see that Nicodemus stood up for Jesus, you know, He's standing up for Jesus. But how many of you noticed that when the argument was over, all went home but Jesus? Everybody went home but Jesus. It states, every man went to his own house. During Jesus' life, during his earthly ministry, he never had a home. Yeah. His parents had a home and he lived in it, but he never had a home. He never had a home that he called home, a place. He went into other people's homes. They put him up. He never had a home. We had homes. But he never had a home. I mean, did you ever consider that? He never had a place where he could just let down. I mean, I know, I know what that's like. I just came back from Mexico, and I'm living in someone else's home and everything, and they have their order and their way, and you fit into that, and that's fine and everything. But it's nice to just come home and be able to let down. You know, Jesus never had that. <clears throat> and they all here, they all make their statements. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. That's just like Christianity. That's so Christianity. Here's what I believe. Well, here's what I believe. And they're all arguing and telling their sides and, you know, making their points and <clears throat> showing what they believe concerning God. But when the day is done, everybody just walks off from that. And they go home. They go home to their families. They go home to their warm fires and their, the things that are comfortable to them. And, and they were oblivious of Jesus and his need. Oblivious. They, 
I'm trying to get you to picture this. They're arguing back and forth. Well, I believe this. Well, I believe that. And that are, no, I'm right. No, I'm right. And all this kind of stuff. And then once the argument was over, they all walk up. And they're just totally oblivious from that point on. My whole life, my Christian life is making my point. And they get that across. And not even seeing his need for a home. Imagine the Lord left there, standing all alone. I mean, everybody's talking about him. But they walk off. And it says that Jesus, look in uh, verse uh, 1 and 2 of chapter 8 again. <clears throat> Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Well, let's, let's, let's do 53 of the seventh chapter. And every man went unto his own house. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. <clears throat> they walk off to their home. He spends the night goes up to the Mount of Olives, spends the night there. And then early in the morning, he comes to the temple. He's not there. He didn't come into the temple like, <clears throat> you know, someone finding rest and, you know, getting some relaxation from the, all the toil of the day and all the ministry and all of the things that you're carrying on. He comes in, and immediately he's inundated with people who are, you know, clamoring for teaching. Oh, Jesus. You know, no thought of whether he's got a home or not, whether he's got a habitation. Spent all night on the Mount of Olives. No thought. Nobody putting him up. Nobody thinking about that. Oh, let's go to Jesus. And they, I'm sure they walked in the temple that morning, saw him there, and figured, oh, he was in his temple. The Lord's in his temple. Right? That he probably spent the whole night there. He didn't. <clears throat> and they say, start teaching us. Because Christianity isn't about Christ living in you. Christianity is about teaching and learning and growing and being blessed with the word. And Jesus opening it, the word, opening his heart, the word pertaining to who I am in Christ is the way it, it normally is put. <clears throat> and I see that they are willing to allow him in the temple for teaching purposes. They're willing for that. They're open to that. And it's not even that they're not willing to give him a habitation. They don't even have any thought of it. And not even a thought of it. They're oblivious to that side of the Lord. Totally oblivious. It's not like they're rejecting or they just, you know, they're just going along life. And it's like, well, Jesus shows up just at the right time and he teaches me. And then we run away and we go show everybody and everybody's impressed with what we got from the Lord. And we don't know where he's at or what's going on in between. <clears throat> Whether he's got that habitation. And, and I, I'll bet you that when they gathered together to hear him teach, they didn't give a second thought to where he spent the night. I mean, they're all going down one road with, you know, it's no different than modern day Christianity. It's no different than, you know, people deserting Christ concerning his habitation. Deserting his heart, deserting his need for us to be a habitation. For the cross to do anything more than bless me and give to me and forget you.
or just being so oblivious that his need doesn't come to mind because he exists for my need. That's all. So let me just end with this. Who is going to, who is going to help accomplish the thing that's going to wipe away his tears? He's weeping because they didn't make room for him. No, not at his birth in the end. No, not at the very end as Jerusalem was meant to be his place of rest and the, the city. Who's going to set a course like the Levites who called of God, had a heart? Who is on the Lord's side? And they separated themselves and said, we will exist in Israel, not for our own lives. We won't even get a portion in the land. We will exist for one purpose. And that is wherever we go, we'll set up a habitation for him. We'll make sure that he's got a habitation. <laughs> that we come to this place where we say, we are no longer satisfied with what God will do for us. And again, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do that unless you see heaven open and you see the temple open and you look within and you see the ark there, the testimony of God, that's what the ark's called, the testimony of God is in the church. The testimony of Christ in you is in the church. Well, that's not the case right now. So there has to be Levites. There has to be people with a heart after God. There has to be those who will prepare the way for the Lord in this manner. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Maybe you'd like to just Come up here and just, just sort of join hearts. You don't have to, and I don't, I don't believe that if you don't come up here that you aren't yielding to God. But maybe, <clears throat> maybe it would be a point of faith for you to just do that, and we'll just pray. We won't go long. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, my Lord Jesus. My Lord Jesus. My Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We all love you. We all love you. We love you, but do we love you? Or were we saying we love what you do for us? Are we declaring what you do for us? Or are we declaring that we are on your side? Who is on the Lord's side? We know you're on our side. We know you're faithful. We know you will give and give and give and give. And you'll never ask and you'll never show one sign of your need. And you'll meet again the next morning totally having no true rest. And you'll minister to us. Father, there must be those who have hearts like David, those that have a heart after you to provide you with the church being the temple of God, the temple of your presence, Christ in us. The hope, your hope, not ours, Christ in us, your hope of glory. Father, we've spent many months now over this subject.
Lord, let it not just be another teaching. Lord, may our hearts be broken for you for a change and not just break breaking us so that for us. And Lord, I just pray that there'd be somebody, several somebodies here, that this would so burn in their heart that their whole life, Lord, their whole life would be like David, just given till he drew his last breath. Jesus, the church would be what you always meant it to be. Oh, Father, Father, help us to be workers together with you to provide ourselves and others and others and others as this place of rest for Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to allow your testimony to be in us and to bring that testimony to as many brothers and sisters as we'll hear, not forcing anything, not forcing anything, not thinking we're superior, not acting superior, not talking down to people. Father, that is all so contrary to your spirit and to the spirit of Christ within us, to the spirit of what we teach, contrary. But that we will, in meekness and in love, speak the words of your heart and others will perceive this is not just somebody arguing what they believe and then going their own way. But it is coming from a true place of desire that you would get your habitation out of this church. Grant us all mercies to be able to truly fulfill these things and to do it in the right spirit and grant grant a door of utterance to be opened to those who so direct their lives or have their lives directed that they may speak with clarity and boldness the truth and others may get past the person and to the real essence of what's being communicated. Father, my words and my prayers aren't even enough. See the hearts of your people here. See, as David, what afflictions they have gone through to provide you a place. Have mercy on them. Use blessing. Give them the ability to reach others. May the torch from your heart to David's, from David's, down through Jesus, down into us, pass. And may it burn within us. And may it be a bright, shining light that never goes out within us. We ask in Jesus' name.